nada, agradeceros por venir tan temprano. Thank you very much for coming this early. I know it is very, very early for a Sunday. But the idea is in the next couple of hours to talk to you about a couple of algorithms, which is AES for symmetric time and RSA. Although some people think that it's still got um, some life. And to remove all the mystery that surrounds cryptography. Cryptography has uh, been around for over 25 years. You can see it from a mathematical viewpoint. We can look in depth at things that are difficult to accept by an engineer, but you can actually apply cryptography in your day-to-day -day life. And if you look at it, you don't actually need to have a great knowledge of maths with just a couple of uh, uh, basic notions and you and know what modular symmetrics is. You can have a better idea of cryptography just to understand how cryptography works and whether the algorithms that we use today are secure or, or strong. Another thing that we're going to look at is uh, algorithmic complexity. So there, you're either going to have to learn maths or ask for the help of a true mathematician. We'll be talking about white box. But to understand cryptography, that we use today, the standard kind of cryptography, it's sufficient just to have a couple of notions of math, and it's a, a way of telling people, yes, you can learn cryptography without needing to be a mathematician. Before I start, I've been told not to move too much. I'm gonna, not going to introduce myself. My name is Jorge Ramio Aguirre. I work, and I've been working in cryptography for the last 25 years at the Polytechnic uh, University in Madrid and the UNID, and also in Latin America. And for the last 25 years, I've been the cryptogra cryptography man, basically. And now with Alfonso Muñoz, we are in charge of CryptoRed, which is an 18-year-old network. In fact, it was 18 quite uh, recently to make people aware of what security actually means. So let's talk about cryptography. There's symmetric and asymmetric cryptography. Let's try to compare the different algorithms that we use today. And if you look where it says uh, symmetric uh, encryptors, the algorithms either work re reverse when I encrypt, or the forms work uh, inversely, or it's the keys that work uh, in reverse. So one key when you emit and one when you receive. So what uh, the key does, the other reflects it. So. Encryption systems, when they're symmetric, there are two kinds of classification. We've got the flow, i.e. byte to byte, which were very interesting a few years ago. And in fact, there was an algorithm, which is RC4, and that was untouchable. It was a standard a few years back. But a weakness was found in it that was published in the internet. And nowadays, any sort of handshake protocol that we do amongst the protocols, you now will not find RC4. It comes about uh, around number 20. So RC4 has completely disappeared. It uh, fell uh, on bad times. Another flow and crypt. There's another one that was very interesting until about 2000, which is called A5. It's a GSM type. We're, of course, now working uh, on different, but it was vulnerable to attacks, and it could uh, force our mobiles to work with GSM because we'd uh, lost coverage. We think it's a network problem. 
there was a system that could send us GSM uh, information, it would force us to work on GSM. When you work with GSM, the algorithm that was used was called A5, which is a bit by bit uh, flow encryption, but it was also a little bit unsafe because GSM committed the terrible uh, crime of not making the code public. So the code needs to be public. And that's the second Kirchhoff principle who said that strength of just receiving uh, one key, everything else is public. So they made it secret, the algorithm. They did reverse engineering, RSA, in 1999, and with a $20,000 machine in six years, which, of course, we will never have, but a criminal organization has, you could actually break this A5 algorithm in just a few seconds, and you could listen to um, a mobile phone call. So these are the flow algorithms that are sort of... Um, exiting stage left at the moment, but they might have, get a second kind of youth because they're very fast algorithms. You don't need to have a block and then sign or encrypt, but you can do a byte to byte. So, so we've got RC4 that encrypts a byte to byte and with each byte a message. Let's now look at the next block, which is called uh, block encryption. We've got uh, remainders of algorithm DES, which from 1996 onwards was no longer standard. We stu still find the triple DES algorithm, which is still used, obviously not in internet, the most um, recent ones I've seen are in Firefox, and, but since 2012, 2011, 13, so for um, last five years you won't get triple deaths in any internet communication. A different matter is that uh, when you go to the security scheme, the security setup, you have to encode a high character level data. You can either work with IS, 206, and some with 3 des. So in some apps do use some triple des, but it's very slow, and it's far slower than the IS uh, algorithm. So, as you can see, we're going to look at IS uh, algorithms, because it's probably going to be a standard until 2014. And then when we talk about public key systems or asymmetric, is that there's two keys, one in the emitter system and the other in the receiver system. This was uh, started in 1976, when two Stanford researchers, Marty Hellman and Wilfred Diffie, proposed something that revolutionized cryptography, which is called key exchange. In 1976, we already had quite powerful algorithms, such as the A, sorry, the DES algorithm, which had 57 uh, key bits. But there were others, such as Lucifer, used in the UK military, which uh, had 158 key. And the problem was the next. We had a very good algorithm to decipher information, but we didn't know how to send the key. So here, I'm in Santander, you're in Madrid, and how can they send me the key? They either brought it by hand, which is the sort of thing that happened with the Enigma machine in the Second World War, but otherwise there was no uh, definition way of following. So, in a protocol system, they looked at a way of uh, exchanging a key between emitter and a receiver in a computational manner. Of course, you can break it, but you, in practice, you actually can't. If you use the keys with the 2048 uh, bits today, if you want to try it, these algorithms, the only solution would have to be a brute force attack. But it's virtually only the way of breaking them. 
So it's a, because it's an exponential one. So as the number goes up, and the numbers get much, much bigger. So we've got this ends. If you try to buy a key, which is sim similar to trying to break a key, an AES key, we need millions and millions of attempts. And we wouldn't have uh, the ability. And we're not talking about quantic computation. That's a different kettle of fish. With currently current machines, it's uh, virtually impossible because you can't attack cryptography. You can avoid cryptography. So we can have man in the middle, but you don't actually break the algorithm, but you, you just break through how the algorithm is implemented when you exchange the key. So here we've got these two keys one in the sender, one in the receiver. They're mathematically one the reverse of the other. And you can't divide them. You, it's, if you try to divide them, we're using with uh, whole numbers, and you, it just doesn't work. You can't divide, but you can by multiply it. You can multiply by a minus one, which means that some numbers are the reverse of a body. That's the difference between a public and a private key. But what one key does, the other undoes. So you've got this exponentiation um, system between them. And what exponentiation does is it multiplies by, it a, num by a number elevated to n with the exchange of key, or my private key if what I've got a digital signature, but it's always a number elevated to an exponential and reduced to a module. A public module, you all know the public module, what happens is you don't need the PIQ. And between the two, we've got RSA, the DH, and we've also got Elgamal algorithm. It's fairly complex, but they basically do the same thing. In the case of RSA and Elgamal, they do it uh, confidentially, or you have to digitally sign it. And then we've got uh, the some stroke product uh, way of doing things. We've got the, certain, the famous MH rucksacks, MH bags, and elliptic curves. And it's only if you've got you, if you've got these uh, this Harvard device that you can uh, start the app, the hard drive, and then go on to the RAM so it's uh, deciphered and it'll run. So here we've got the RSA algorithm and the AES algorithm. Why? Well, because the issue of elliptic curves is have greater preponderance with key exchanges between client and servers. You'll start to see the DH type, but there's still this RSA algorithm. And if you go to the NCBA page, you can see that we're working with TLS, and you'll see we've got RSA with algorithm AES128, and there you can see CBC SHA. So that's why I ch I've chosen RSA and AES just to do a little workshop, and uh, I've uploaded a little document onto internet, so if you want to repeat this lesson at home, you can do so. So that's why we've used RSA and AES, because that's what we're going to look at in uh, this uh, a workshop. So we're going to look at AES uh, just briefly, then we'll watch uh, a video, uh, animated uh, video, which has been organized by some of our students, and it'll be published uh, 20 to three months.
There are different uh, blocks, different uh, pieces to it. It's quite easy to understand how the AES works quite graphically. Difficult to understand how it works math mathematically. Then, there you have to know about uh, polynomials. That's far more complex. If anybody wants to know about it in the address, uh, the next. Um, talk, you can see my uh, email address and an article that I wrote which talks about the polynomials and how they work with the AES. It's a bit of a pain, but if you want to see it, you can do so. But it's easy to understand it graphically, AES. So I'm going to introduce in 1997 NIST didn't certify DES every four to five years. It had its life validated. And But why? Because in 1997, 1998, some attacks called Death Challenge started, in which RSA, the Asymmetric Cryptography Company, which was the de facto standard at that time and still is today, adapted to the size of the key. We're talking about key of 100, keys of 128 uh, bits, and because 512 uh, bits was considered stratospheric. So RSA, what it did was it adapted to the times and gradually increased key size. So a few years ago, we used 1,028 bits. Now it's 1,048 bits. I know algorithmically that's fairly poor. Would it be better to make a new algorithm? We've just actually increased the size of the key. It's like getting a bigger bike instead of buying a car or a motorbike. What we've just done is making progress so that attacks are more difficult, but the algorithm is the same one that we've been using 40 years ago. Let's see why. Why didn't NIST certify DES? Because there was a massive attack that was known at an internet level because an RSA complained that they had uh, colleagues in SSL so when we know that this asymmetric cryptography, we use RSA. And RSA has adapted to the need. So we've increased the key 12, 24, 40, and now 1,048. But DES is an algorithm that was uh, criticized a lot at the time. And, and the key uh, was actually downloaded, uh, that had been created, the father key. And it went from 128 to 64 bits. And NSA and, or NIST said that this key could be typed into ASCII. ASCII at that time wasn't extended uh, more, more than 128. And the eighth bit was a pariah bit. So it just got rid of each, uh, the eighth uh, character of each uh, bit. So the drop is astronomic uh, from 12856. 56. There were some justifications that they said that they wanted that for banking operations, for getting money out of cash points. We're talking about 1974. We're talking about the first semiconductors that consumed a lot, that heated up, and it was very, very difficult. So it wasn't worth it. That's why they left the key. That's what some people think. But others think that they just wanted to have a control over this kind of algorithm. If you want to talk about paranoia later, there's a lot of paranoias out there. And today, we've left them aside. But paranoias in cryptography have always existed, ever since Alan Turing's time. And NSA, for many, many years, what it tried to do was to prohibit everything that they weren't uh, able to do. And then they realized that the best thing to do was to have the best mathematicians in the world in the NSA. So. So they decided that the best defense is an attack at the end of the day. DES was considered safe, but very slow. 
it, they called a, a public tender to the new uh, symmetric uh, encryption, and that became a world standard at the AES in October 2000, after this two-year public tender. It was decided that AES would be the standard algorithm. But from the time it's standard until it's used massively, seven, eight, or ten years might go by. So we don't start seeing AES algorithm which until 2008, 2009. And it's been a standard since 2000. So no, now what's going to happen with the hash function? Well, it's probably... Uh, uh, frowned upon. So, but the operations are the same. If the algorithms are badly made, it's going to still carry on working badly, but as there are many more vectors and the hash is much bigger, but it can still be a tract. There's a now a new standard, which is called H3. When is it going to be used? I don't know. Maybe not until 2024, 2025. That what I mean is between an algorithm becoming a standard and then you being used, ten de ten years can go by. But now, if you go to internet and any TLS communication, the standard algorithm used is AES. But actually, until uh, four or five years ago, other algorithms were still used. Right. I'm just going to explain why AES has become so popular and why it's going to be the standard until 2040. And instead of looking at slides, we'll actually watch a video which is a lot easier to understand. So what happened with DES? Well, there was a world attack called a DES challenge. And in just two years, between 1997 and 1999, there were all sorts of network attacks because a symmetric algorithm can be easily attacked because the key is a, is a number, so I can look for it myself. So I look for it in all the different fields. It's not too complicated. But if we all look at it and each one goes to a room until they find the key and then they tell us, oh, I found it on the fourth floor. Here it is. And that's what happened. So it's easy to do a, a mass attack. And that's the problem with these algorithms. That's why we need to have a key today of uh, 128 bits, or more or less. Otherwise, it can be broken because it's divided by n. So the end of all of this, what we decided at the end of January 1999, the key was broken in less than a d. Algorithms that supposedly are, uh, have a strength that are going to last for millions and millions of years can be broken in one day. Uh, just 100 people connected to internet, they managed to break it in just less than 24 hours. So, of course, that requires time. And this is the number of keys per second that were being calculated during that time. It was 1999. So they managed to get to a rate of 150 million per year. I like this. And people say, why is it so secure today to work with 128 bits? Why don't we use 256 bits? You have to realize what a key actually means. Uh, the DES algorithm that was broken in 1999, well, we had to go through the key. The key is just one. If it was four bits, it would be a number between 0 and 15. If we trial it, and I think of a 0 to 15, and you say, is it 8? And I say, no. Is it 4? No. Is it 5? Yes. If we do that on several occasions, how many times are you going to ask, on average, 8? Maybe sometimes you'll get it right the first time, and sometimes you'll get it right after four times. But on average, if the number's got four bits between 0 and 15, then on average, every eight questions, you're going to get uh, probably the right answer. But in this case, in 22 hours, they need 40 hours. So the key space goes from 000 to FFFF. So you're never going to go through the whole of the key space. If you find it easily, you get it quickly, but otherwise not. So half and half average, you take about 40 hours.
But then you've got the Mer law, which says that every year and a half, a computation capacity uh, is doubled. But there's a limit to that, because the, the more law can be multiplied by uh, 100 or 100 million, but, but you can still need all these years. So with this computational capacity of 1999, with everything that happened back in 1999, and you multiply it by several million millions every time a year goes back, according to Moore's law, doesn't uh, uh, multiply it by two, but several million every two years. So this X uh, number comes so big that the only thing you can do is uh, put it to 2 elevated to 64. Do you know what 2 2 elevated to 64 is? Well, the, the size of the universe is 2 elevated to 37, and it's really impossible here to break. So we're talking about quantic uh, computation. So it's virtually impossible to break this encryption. So it's meaningless to say, oh, wouldn't it be great if we had... Um, encryptions that went up from 128 bits. There's no point. Even if you had all the world computational uh, centers working for millions and millions of years, it would be possible to get the average. Because security is computational, which means that probably it's very difficult. Probabilistically, it's difficult to break the key, and, and until that will happen day after day. Okay, that's what it is. So it's virtually, virtually impossible. It's very, very difficult to break this, unless you've got brute, brute force. So let's look at this uh, on a video. It's far more fun. I've got a video here somewhere. I've downloaded two videos on for the Crypto Read page. And the document that we're going to uh, use a little later on, if you uh, type in what you can see in the screen, you'll find it. I saw there was a, a mistake in the middle of the video, so I changed it. But also when you download it, I removed the accent. And if you, so if you go to Twitter, it won't find you this page. So I've got, had to have two uh, documents, uh, one with the accent and one without the accent. But anyway, you can get this document to download it. And one is about the AES algorithm. And the second part will be about RSA. So, any questions before watching this video? Yes, please. There's a microphone out there somewhere. Other, otherwise, it's very tiring if it's just me talking. Otherwise, it won't be recorded, the question, and we want to record it. Okay. Good morning. You're talking about quantic computers? But without using this kind of technology, although some companies uh, do have it, what about these s CPUs that are be used for Bitcoin mining? It has been improved quite a lot. Yes, you're right. The CPUs, which are far faster than PCs, but they still aren't as fast as quantic computers. Quantic computers are a different ball game. This is something that in another talk I've spoken about in Latin America, in Argentina. And this is something, because we don't know what's going to happen in the future with these very in a very short space of time. So who's going to know about cryptography if everything's quantic or either a, physici or either a physicist 
Are they going to have to study quant quantum physics in second or third uh, year? But a few years ago, I brought Marty Hellman, and he said that by the year 2030, and we may, he may have got this wrong because there are many companies such as Amazon, Google, and, and large uh, big governments are using quantum computing. But for a while, these quantum computers haven't been very stable. And we're not talking about a PC. And we're not talking about something that has cost four, five thousand dollars. It's far more complex than that. But everything that today is based on computational security, everything is uh, done in parallel. You can. Everything is done in parallel, so you could get hundreds of thousands of trillions of calculations per second. And this, of course, is going to change the world of cryptography in the future. And I'm hoping just in 10 to 15 years for now, like i.e. for the day after tomorrow, many banks are concerned about uh, the security side of things, because as I said, they could have a problem which uh, what, what I'm going to explain to you now. I, I mean, so, you know, the, the days may be numbered for this uh, kind of research. In Europe, it's 2020. Almost all the projects in cryptography are in post quantum uh, cryptography. Post quantum. What will we do after the war, after the fourth? Uh, world War. All these systems today are very powerful regarding the conventional machines, the ones that we know. But uh, when talking about quantum matters, that will be different. I'm not an expert on that. It's quite complex, but uh, Many people are working with qubits, and the computation is totally parallel. I don't know what will happen in the future. I have my doubts. But I think people are interested by this. It's about philosophy. T today, people speak about this uh, quantum exchange with a fiber. And instead of BT bytes, it's photons. And this exists commercially already. But there are no algorithms to sign and encrypt in a quantum way. When this happens, the key exchange will not be computationally secure, but mathematically secure. When you know perfectly that between you and me, we exchange the key, then we will communicate. Nobody will intervene there. If anybody reads, and sees the spins, the vertical polarized or the, the horizontal polarization, you will see if anybody has uh, entered. But states are not going to allow for you to have 100% security. So about quantum techniques are being uh, researched. Maybe in five to, to 10 years, we'll have that. Not for us, but, but for big governments and for big um, companies and bodies, and maybe some criminal bodies too. Unfortunately, I can't answer you this question. Any more questions, or we will talk about AES algorithm? Let's see this piece, the video. Crypto network. Pill number 30. How can you crypt with AES algorithm? The birth of AES algorithm in 1997, in the NIST opened an international competition to develop a new standard symmetric algorithm to replace the DES. It was fragile because there were many attacks sent by RSA. The challenges. The new algorithm will be called AES. Fifteen candidates. And after two years, at the end of the year 2000, the 
Winner is Rijndaal by Vincent Rickman and John Damon from Belgium. Features of the AES algorithm. AES is an advanced encryption standard with 128 bits. This is the description. It uses the state matrix 4x4, 16 cells or bytes are changing in value according to the processes executed by the algorithm using substitution and permutation techniques with polynomial uh, operations in a body. All the op um, en encryption operations are done on bytes in words of 32 bits that are written from top to bottom and from the left to the right. For a 128-bit key, the algorithm will do 10 rounds. If the key is 192 bits, it's 12 rounds. And for 156 bits, it's 14 rounds. In each of these rounds, a generated key will be generated from the master key. The encryption algorithm starts with a function called a round key with the sum between the message bytes and the key bytes. For a 128-bit key, 10 subkeys will be calculated, one for each round, and the next four operations will be done during nine rounds. Subbytes, sit graus, mix calliums, and a ground key. Only the operations that subbytes, sit graus, and a drought key are repeated. This gives you a matrix, matrix with 16 bytes, which is the first cryptogram to the, for the decryption. We have to go uh, just, the, do, we need to do the invert, inverse uh, path. The inverse, mixed galliums, subrows, and ground key. And so it's the other way around. The subbytes. So it grows, makes galliums, and a round key. In the subbytes operation, there's a substitution of each of the 16 bytes of the matrix through this table. The operation three rows is a permutation of the rows. The state rows of the first row doesn't turn. The one turns one byte, the second turns two bytes, and the third turns three bytes. Mix galliums. It's a bit more complex. It's multiplying each of the columns of the state status matrix with a fixed polynomium. A round key function. This is the or exclusive sum of each round with the status matrix values. The generation of the keys of each round of the AES algorithm to generate the 10 subkeys necessary for AES figure of 128 bits, we need the key expansion function. To modify the status matrix through the root war operation, turning the first uh, byte of the matrix, then apply to these resulting words the subbyte operation and later on summing or exclusive this word with a word that is three positions uh, behind with a vector called as rcom, different for each of the ten rounds, it originating the new word of the first key. Then three times the sum or exclusive is done between the new word and the with those that is located three spaces behind. It's uh, the, key me mm, the key of round one. This process, process is repeated until we get the 10 necessary sub-keys. So it's quite easy to understand the, the work done by AES algorithm. It's not that complex. If you want to see it, how the subbytes uh, function is obtained. There are mathematics behind it, but it's just a, a, a table of 256 uh, ca characters in hexadecimal. And the entry 1F is like the exit bit, bit 3. That's all. It's very easy to do the operations. Around key is the X, X or uh, operation type, byte to byte to 32, 
number of uh, words because the uh, Windows calculator accepts uh, 64 bits and the only complex operation is multiplying by each of the columns by, with this um, original Mac matrix. And the generation of sub keys, it's easily understood. It's not complex. The AS algorithm has mathematics underneath. So it's quite secure on the mathematical side. Before uh, showing a software uh, that we can play with, uh, with OPCCR, we can check that the operations are not really the, the ones they say. We're talking about computational or mathematical security. In quantum cryptography, maybe, we will have a security that it will not only be computational, but, math but mathematic. Security is 100% sure. It, today, we have the computational security. It's the computational time to, that we, you need to break a key. It's a lot. Let's imagine 256, one more bit, you multiply by two, the effort and the time. By two, if it was linear. In the case of AES, it's linear, but in RSA, it's not linear. But means that, that it's attack by force, just time that it's needed. Somebody could find a cryptogram knowing uh, the packages, and it is encrypted with AES 128, knowing why well, it's the key. Hexadecimal C3B847B8A6. If, if you find it, it's the, the end of security in NASA and uh, NSA, but there are very low probabilities. So this security level is accepted. So it's computational uh, security. They can't break the key. Yes, they can in one try. Yes. The possibility of probability that of this happening, uh, it's like uh, it's impossible. Well, it, it's very, very improbable, very unlikely. So we need to know this because it's going to uh, be important for the concept of security in the future. Well, I sh this is just the, the same in the video. This is just a table OPC, similar to billionaires' tables. I'm going to put it in or the f zoom so that you can see it. It's a kind of a billionaires' table, but underneath the, there is mathematical operations. If you want to change the byte, that is 5a, this byte decimal and we have four bits for each value. This corresponds to the byte BE. There's a uh, mathematical explanation. I use the table, I don't use the maths, because this is a fixed table, it doesn't change. There's a direct uh, table and there's an inverted uh, table from top to down and from down to top. So it's the invert, the, just the uh, inverted operations that are used. That's multiplication of columns. When we speak about keys, this is interesting. Today, we use AS256. The AS256 it has a big key. It's more secure because it's more difficult to attack with brute force. To attack 256 bits than 128 because to attack 128 bits, you have to do a lot of tries. But to attack 256 bits, the average is many more trials. It's horrible. <laughs> so difficult. But there's, there's something interesting here. It appears in some of the documents, the rounds, the symmetrical algorithms like AES, Lovish, and uh, uh, many other algorithms. Take a, a key, there is a, a series of sub keys, and there are many rounds. Algorithm AES does 10 rounds, 12 and 14. The DES algorithm did, uh, did 16 rounds. Others do 52. All of the algorithms do rounds. How can we explain? I want to mi mix up the bits of the message and the bits of the key. So I always have a given example that is from another colleague, but I took it with me, the concept of mayonnaise sauce. Well, you, you have uh, oil and egg. So there's the key. If I do a normal mayonnaise, I put two eggs, the oil, and then I have a mixer. 
uh, have to maintain the the mixer on so that it starts making the mayonnaise. I have two options. I put the egg in the oil. I press the button for six minutes until the mayonnaise is done, or I just do a 12 seconds and I stop it. Another round, 12 seconds, I stop. I do it in various rounds. That's the concept of rounds. What would happen? Julian Assange mentioned that from WikiLeaks. He's an expert on cryptography. He did a testament and he, he encrypted the, his testament with uh, the algorithm AES. He was criticized that AES algorithm when it was turned for 256 bits, that it needed more rounds, more than 14, like 16 rounds. The explanation is graph very clear. Instead of doing the mayonnaise with uh, this type of hen eggs, I use uh, ostrich eggs. I need more times, more rounds, because it's more difficult to do it with ostrich uh, eggs. You need a good emulsion. You need more rounds with a mixer. So this, the AES algorithm is very strong with 256 bits. But with, but maybe with other attacks, it could be very weak, because we can do a, a follow-up. Where are the bits of the keys? Maybe you've read something about Julian Assange. We have the speed, symmetrical algorithm. That's the case of AES. This is the, the 50 megabytes per second. That's the speed. The algorithm uh, triple Ds is ten, five times uh, slower. It's very slow. If we compare it with the asymmetrical RSA, Diffie German, Ergamal, there's a, a substantial difference. The difference is that these the systems, the symmetrical systems like AES, have a, an encryption uh, rate of hundreds of megabytes per second. The, the other algorithms have um, an encryption um, rate of kilobytes per second. The difference is 1 to 1,000. So the asymmetrical um, systems are, are, say, are used but for light operations to exchange keys and for uh, digital signature. Uh, I want to have this key for AES 256. I have no problem doing that because if we go to this rate of dozens of kilobytes per second, there's no problem because the value that you're going to encrypt is very, very low. Or well, I can have a hash function. I'm going to sign it. I have a big document. I can't sign all the document because the system rate is very low, 10 megas, because it takes 40, 50 seconds to sign. I do a hash. I compress the hash with another 256 bits with a rate of hundreds of kilobytes per second. It's easy. But then uh, if I want to send a lot of documentation that is uh, encrypted with a RCA algorithm. I use symmetrical uh, cryptography for digital signature so that I know what is the server that is most secure. That's a kind of a digital uh, signature that I check with VeriSign, with, with Serena, another certification that I have in my machine. And then I send this server a session key these are 256 bits that my AES algorithm are going to uh, run. It's going to run. This is done in the asymmetric encryption. But when I get the page from the bank, and they have this first snapshot, I have animated elements. I say, no, please send me the last 10 movements, not this page. So there's an exchange of very heavy uh, information. I do symmetric cryptography with AS with a key of 256 bits that we have exchanged with asymmetric cryptography. That's the difference. People ask me, why do you work with symmetrical uh, systems with 128, 192, or 256 bits with AS? But when you use asymmetric um, Cryptography, we have thousands of bits. Well, what happens with asymmetrical models? Do we need to know the answer? Nobody has looked into my notes. Anybody knows the answer? When we work with uh, symmetrical systems, it's, it's from zero to F. 
So if I'm working with 256 bits. The key could be anyone. The AES algorithm accepts all the keys, even two zeros. It could be zeros or refs. So it's two to 256. It's a lot. And each key is possible from all zeros to all ones, whatever. Each key can be can be there. But in RSA, it's based on two prime numbers, T and Q. The digital certificate shows me the module in the workplace where the Amazon or the bank works. The website is secure. This is the product of two prime numbers. How can I break the RSA? Well, it's difficult to, very impossible to do it today, but in our exercise here, we can do it. An option was to factorize the secret of the bank is that, in fact, there's a, a, a couple of prime numbers, and I own, no, only known the product, 244 bits. It's very complicated. I knew, no, need to factorize. If I factorize, I break the secret value of this digital certificate, and very rapidly, I can find the key, private key from the public key. Okay. So, the asymmetrical uh, systems are uh, thousands of times slower, and we use them to exchange information and sign uh, the asymmetrical digitally, because there's key in exchange, and to uh, encrypt information, we use the symmetrical algorithm. I want to keep uh, an encrypted document in a partition of my drive. I do uh, with AES and with other um, symmetrical algorithm type because sometimes it's too slow in the asymmetrical systems. Here you can um, do, do some exercises and practice. There's a software called ISphere. I'm going to show it to you now. If, if we go to Google and we ask for ASphere, Crypto network. It's a software. We click here, and we can download it. It's a couple of students who've done this, but it's Java. You can uh, download it and install it. We have a system to uh, do cryptographic pr exercises with this type of software. It's here. I'm just looking for it. This is the exercise. So it's downloaded. There's no installation requirement. Double click here in a sphere. There are documents and you can play with them and practice. Dot hard and we have this type of software in English or Spanish. We can uh, encrypt, decrypt attacks and operations. Operations are the typical operations of the algorithm. That's all. I can, you, the subbytes, mixed columns, or the wrong key. These operations in, that you've seen in the video, they're quite simple. Uh, and this is an uh, crypt, encryption and decryption operation that we're going to do, similar to what you've seen in the document that I uploaded in, into the internet. It's quite simple. This is the document that I uploaded in the internet. I have exercises here. The, the hexadecimal, you have all this on the screen. Here, what we can do, we can run any type of cal hash calculators that you will find in the internet. This Lava Soft, and some of that we use with our students. The, the sentence was that Chica de Ipanema, that's the bus. So I take the hash out of that and it gives me the value of 128 bytes. And the text, 640 characters, La Chica de Ipanema and the rest of the song. This message, I, I took it from the internet, This it's 640 bits. It's the exact block that is worked or run by the AES algorithm. It's 16 bytes, 256 bits. 
So 128 multiplied by 5, it's exactly uh, the, the figure that the AS uh, algorithm works with. We have an exact block, 64 bits. AAS, 128 bits. And the message or the document, it's not coherent with 128 bits. We need to add something. It's the, the, the DESA algorithm, it was a set of zeros. In the AES, it's the amount of bits that I, I miss that I need here. You need 10 bytes. I will give you 10 repeated six, 10 times. You, have, you need six bytes repeated in the, in the last block. So 0, 06 multiplied by six times. So I have 10 that is repeated 16 times. But this is by default. Even if the document has an exact value of 128 bits multiplied by n, I need always the, the missing parts. The message is exactly the same until the dot 640 bits. That's uh, a full value of, uh, and then plus the, 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 the necessary bits that were missing, the filling. Let's take the text. Let's control C. We get to the software. I'm going to encrypt something. I'm going to, and the key is an hexadecimal system, 64. It's a typical question. This is asked at university, and people say, "I don't, I don't know." I copied it, and this is a way of using symptoms that can be compatible. All, all digital certificates have this format, but once I have this, I have the the plain text. With a document, if I'm working with OpenSSL, I can not do it uh, on the screen. I just need to introduce a document with a file, txt. Well, so we have the full text from here we, until the point, the dot. Control C, and this is the text AC, AC type of text. Control V. So we do Control V sometimes. It happens with Windows, and the cursor is is here. There's an enter, and there's one more byte. So we have to be careful. And everything is encrypted in a modern cryptography. So the cursor is there. And I know that there's a file with an exact value of 128 bits. The base could be 24. We can put it into a file or hexadecimal. 64 is very typical. And two types of uh, figures, SCB. The, it's by, de by default in the algorithms, but it's forbidden to, be, to use it. There are attacks against these uh, figures. And then what's used today is CBC. So I have two keys, the one I type and another one that is called initial vector. Could be secret or no, or not. You can associate it with OpenCL system. You introduce salt. If you introduce salt, then you introduce random values in the hexadecimal. So the key is not that simple, as you can imagine. So CD mode, the ciphering could be direct. Direct encryption uh, will have a direct result, or step by step, it will show me what it does in every other round. Direct result, because uh, we are late. Uh, exit. I will have this exit, the output, in base for 64 format with open SSL. You'll see exactly it's the same, but the command is a little bit special. We won't do it, but I'm going to show it to you. Here, the filling, that's the plain text. And here, this is the filling of the necessary bytes. If one zero it, from exit decimal goes to decimal, you need a filling. But I need 16 more bytes because it's the sixth block and everything is full of fillings. And as we do this type of uh, ciphering uh, operations, we have it here. 
Lo tenemos en este, en este documento. También podríamos hacer algún tipo de... Here we can do some uh, encryption operations in this case with OpenSL a bit complex and uh, heavier. I'm going to show it to you. This is the operation with the SSL. This is the decryption process here. We have the SSL operation. Win32, Win64, doesn't matter. You can download OpenSSL, will be the program. A is the algorithm, minus 128, the number of bits that you're going to use. CBC mode, or whatever type of mode, we use CBC. But there's another mode, the counter. And there's more, a new mode called uh, counter plus. And it's being used, in the, in, and it's going to be the standard. No salt. What is no salt? You, do you know what it means to introduce salt into a, an encryption? If we introduce salt, something ha interesting will happen. The program is going to my well to my key. It's a sentence that I that I chose. Why it introduces extra hexadecimal extra hexadecimal figures? So it's very difficult to be attacked. Random tables. Remem remember that. If I have a password that is one two three four, well, there's a hash function. Five is one, and we have a whatever value f five f f five, b three c four. We put it in Google, and automatically there's a number of pages appearing. So this is within a database of hash functions that are well known. But if I add salt, a plus one two three one two three four b four c three one f, obviously, this is nowhere. In no database. We add salt. salt. In the AES system, adding salt uh, is very useful. You introduce a key, la chica de Ipanema, that's a text. You encrypt the message, and it's a cryptogram. You re encrypt with the same key, la chica de Ipanema. The first initial characters say, I'm the AES algorithm, I'm working with SSL, the initial command. And then there's the cryptogram, which is completely different. Nobody knows it. Don't add salt so that you can use your key that, uh, that you're going to introduce. So this the entry text is one cyber camp. This is a 640 bit text in TXT. And the exit is an AES algorithm. I use the amateur base 64. We can read it in any machine. And the key. K, the Altica de Ipanema, that's the key, but don't use the AC values. M5 is what I prefer. With M5, that's the one you use as a key. Okay, so you do enter and that's it. So, as I said, this is an exercise. If you want to do it, you can do it without any kind of problem. Let's move on to the second part of this presentation. Does anybody have any doubts about RSA? I've got 56 minutes left just for RSA. So are there any problems with the AES algorithms? It's a very easy software, very intuitive. And of course, if anybody has any doubts about software, you can check vectors. What I mean by that is that any kind of software that becomes a standard, the NIF and other algorithms publish a document which says if you put as an entry 0000, zero, 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 zero and, and it ends with FFFF and you work in CBC uh, mode and the initial vector is 111, one, you'll get this. What they do is to give you a set of inputs and outputs so that you can check that it works. And the software has an initial part where you can check all of this, and if you don't agree with it, you can download the NIST uh, document, and NIST will tell you how it works. So let's forget symmetric cryptographies now, which I said are very fast, which encrypt the information symmetrically. And the standard until 2040, until NIST, is going to be the AES algorithm. Um, 2040, I reckon we're going to be with quantum computers. So I think maybe AES uh, maybe isn't going to be the one. But it's going to be at least 512 bits. The thing is, we can't say that we're going to use the key with that's bigger with algorithms or RSA. 
because they come slower. And as time goes by, what I want is for internet to be quicker. It's no good for me going to a bank and you go slowly, slowly, slowly to try to sign. If I go to a bank here in Spain and I see that it takes three or four seconds for the screen to pop up and the closed characters, I realize that something's wrong. And if instead of five uh, or six seconds, it's a minute, you realize the internet's crashed. So there's no point in increasing the key length m madly. But one of the solutions is that when we've got quantum computers, it's just to go really fast forward with the keys, go to RSA, uh, and it'll be almost 2,000 bits, or go to AES algorithms, which allows you to increase key size from 32 to th in 32 to 32-bit packs. So to 128, 192, and 250 bits by default. But you can increase it by in 32-bit stages or uh, steps, but then it gets slower. OK, any questions? Included in these kind of algorithms, this is the first one that uh, appears uh, a year and a half after Mickey Hellman said we just need to change this kind of key, I November 76. And this happened in February 78, just uh, about 18 months afterwards. The problem that Tiki Herman has is that it exchanged a key. It exchanged a key between client and server. But after a protocol, it did both. You know, you sent one thing out and then it returned. And once this had happened, the key to session was a value, but you didn't know what it was. There's a variant there, and I know that you can do the exchange of keys as long as you know the key previously. I'm going to send you an encrypted uh, signed document via an, an email. So what happens is within this envelope, what I do is I include the key and you just are going to be the only person that can open uh, the envelope and get the key. There's a nice protocol that's modified by Mickey Hellman, uh, but you have to know the key at the outset that you're going to be sent. It has to have a value, a hash, then you get the most significant bits or, uh, that you want, and in the end you do the same sort of thing, okay? So it's a little bit more complex, but it's also possible. But Tipi Hellman, in both formats and different protocols only allowed me to do at a key exchange. You couldn't do digital signature. So these people were, were thinking about the whole time until they uh, uh, found RSA, which allowed them to exchange key and have uh, a di digital signature. There's a public key, private key, the two types of key. So you've got the public key and I can send you something confidential because I encrypt it, I put it into your public key, I reduce it to the uh, N module and it's only you that has the private key that opens this public key. So if I put a figure uh, with the public key to, you, to the uh, receiver. But if I do something and I encrypt it with my private key, I s put the document to hash and I send it with a private key, I send it to everybody, but everybody has my public key and they can check that I've done this operation. As I've used hash, they'll know it's an entire document and only I know the private key, they know that I'm the authentic key person. That's what happens with asymmetric cryptography. This algorithm was patented in 1978. It took a long time for people to use it. Lotus no Notes used it, and IBM looked at it. But we're talking about 1978. What's it for? It's for people to sign. What does digital signature mean? People didn't know. But people gradually realized, and this standard is now used worldwide. So let's look at a little example about what happens 
with a key exchange. Here we've got a quite a, a funny story about two lovers. In this case, it's Alice and Bernard. Alice and Bernard want to send a very personal document, Alice to Bernard. How can you do that? Even though a messenger gets it, nobody can read it. It's very easy. It's the box example. I have a box, a box, a bulletproof box with two um, locks on it. So Alice puts her secret message to say, oh, we're going to elope at five o'clock tomorrow morning. And she closes the box with her lock. Then... And then the messages uh, take it to little bow, and it's easy to open and close this lock. So it's a padlock, and you send it via messenger. You can do the same thing with two padlocks. What does Alithia do? He, she opens. So that's what deciphering is. It's removing the padlock. But you, only, you need Bernardo's key. You take Bernardo's key so they get the message back. So it's gone on three trips. Nobody's been able to see the message. And only uh, Bernardo knows that this document comes from Alithia. But the thing is that anybody could put a padlock on something and click. But opening the padlock is private. I'm the only one that's got the key to open the padlock. So. You can say, oh, all right, then, okay, if you close the padlock, that's a public uh, operation, you encrypt it. Let's say opening uh, the padlock is deciphering. So closing a padlock, anybody can do, but opening a padlock, only the person that's got the key can do it. So if you put that into a cryptographic example, saying that Alice... Send, uh, uh, closes the padlock, sends it to uh, Bob. Bob sends it back to Alice. Alice opens the padlock. You can do that with the uh, Caesar algorithm in mode 26, but you may well not uh, get the message because you have to do things in order. Because if I do something and then I close the padlock, you have to then open it. But if you close, uh, and if you close the padlock, I have to open it. So you've got to do it in order. So you can either sign and encrypt or encrypt and sign. But if I first encrypt and then I sign, first you have to check the signature and then you encrypt, then you decipher. But if I sign and then I encrypt, you get the message and then you decipher it. So you have to do it in that order and you have to, that's the only way to check to see if it works, if things are done properly. Here we've got the example of how the RSA works. We've also got another a video here, a four to five minute. And then the same thing, each user chooses a peer and people queue number. Um, well, you may want to have a 300, 1,000 bit number, but no. But a number that's 2,000 bits or 1,000 bits is easy to find. It's just milliseconds. So these two twos are multiplied, the P and the Q. Multiplying is something which a mathematician calls a polynomial. So if you uh, multiply p and q by, uh, and each poo has p has four bits, but if I have to then multiply by four, I have to add them. But if if it's four bits times four bits, it's it's not one thing. But if it's eight bits by eight bits, it takes longer, and that's what the machine does. It works with bit numbers, but it still it requires more time. So it's a kind of a linear relationship or polynomial relationship. If I put a number that's bigger than P and Q, you'll be having to work more. However, if you've got a number N, and N is a product of two of P and Q, if N is very small, you don't take uh, uh, much time. If it's double N, it takes a long time, much more than double, because it's not polynomial. And you can have 300 or 400 bits, and the curve goes up and up, and it's exponential. That's what uh, mathematicians call a polynomial. So it's very difficult to break 
An n value, which is a product of p times q, 800 bits. The only thing that was done about uh, eight, seven or eight years ago was with 700 and something bits. So we all work using 2048 bits today. It's very, very uh, difficult because you need a huge computation capacity. So you uh, make the uh, product public. You can use a 78 module, but you don't know that 78 uh, module actually contains. And what each user does is they calculate each n, each phi n. And in this case, it's for two uh, numbers, it's p minus 1 and q minus 1. If you multiply two, mm, p, uh, two p, uh, p and q, then it doesn't require any side of time. The thing is that the only the owner of the key can do this. The owner of the key knows what P and Q is. Uh, the bank or Amazon, I know the N number. It's a decimal, but actually it's a number. But I don't know P. So once you know that each user or the U knows the Euler indicator, um, we'll do this with the software. I can, if I want, give any public number, three, five, seven, six. It needs to be an odd number. However, to avoid everybody knowing any kind of key, everybody knows is the N4 Fermat number. Sorry, the, the brackets shouldn't be there. It's 2 to the power of 2 to the power of 4, plus 1. That's the Fermat number. This is a prime number, and an interesting prime number, because it turns out that it starts with a 1, and it's got 15 zeros and a 1 at the end. What's that useful for? Well, these systems are very, very slow. We said that earlier, but as they're very slow, it's very difficult to do operations with very big numbers. So if you're the bank, I go into the bank, I send you a number that's 257 uh, bits, which is the AES key, and this uh, random number, I send it to you. And the protocol's a little bit more complex. I send it to you with a public encrypted key. But what is the uh, bank module? The bank has to open, use its private key. I've got the public key of the bank. So what happens with these uh, 248, 248 bits? It turns out that the key, the bank key, is going to be very, very similar. And the bank, to be able to get its session key, it's going to have to see 2,000, 2,048 bits elevated to the power of 2,048, then the 2,048. And that's enormous. That's why we use something completely different. But what happens here? An explanation, a rapid explanation system is used. There's several. And the most well-known one is that if I want to do a rapid exponentiation uh, operation, I put the number into a binary format. And so you have the public bank key. And what I do is just something, and I say x is equal to x squared module n, only if x is 0. If Otherwise, it's x equal to x squared multiplied by the uh, base. And you get squared, 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 and it's just multiplied by base. And it's very, very quick. And this is basically used to make sending a session key uh, more quick. Does anybody know what a lateral channel attack is? Have you heard about a lateral channel attack? It was an RSA. Uh, attack about three and a half years ago. What happened was the machine has a noise, and noise in this case can be a sound, a noise that you can actually hear, or it just might be radio frequency noise, you know, that you can capture uh, an image that's 100 meters away on a screen. Have you heard of Tempest, the Tempest attack? 
If not, look at, for tempest attack in internet, and there are many videos which show that you can capture uh, the image from a building 40 meters away. What some researchers have discovered is that when I do this operation of sending a session key, um, some random IS256, I have to encrypt it to the public key of the bank, elevate it to the power, and I elevate it to this value here. But what happens when it goes to a zero, the program, what does is an X squared module N multiplied by base module one. And they realized that the a computer made a noise. It was one noise for X squared and X, or X squared to the base was a different noise. The, they didn't know it, but the dog knew it. And the dog knew in real time, I uh, know that the key for su such a person was 10001 in real time. Of course, these were white hatted hackers. So before hanging out on the internet, they warned all those people who were working with digital certificate and SSL protocols in computers for them uh, to stop this. So what they did is generated white noise. So instead of listening quite clearly you, the value of 24 kilohertz, which is zero or one, you just heard white noise. So if you, you, could, if you write down acoustic attack RSA, you can see quite clearly all the zeros and ones, the noises that make. But that was used. That's used to attack, not the algorithm, but a physical manifestation of the algorithm in the machine. If the key is bigger, they knew that, that uh, it would take more time. So what they do is they attack the physical manifestations of algorithm. And this, everybody has that public key. One thing that digital certificate, which has been shown by Firefox, appears this decimal number and um, what in Internet Explorer, it's 01001, zero, 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 one, and it's 24 bits. And if you put it in a decimal, it's this, 65,537. So once we do that, what happens? This value here doesn't have uh, factors of DN. If in cryptography we ask a value within a module, then we're trying to find a, a private key. And it turns out that between this number and E, there's no common factor, then automatically I know what the private key is. How do you find the private key? We have to use the extended algorithm, which is very quick. And if everybody wants to see it, there's a video that shows how that can be used. So it's made, the module N is made public. If you go into properties, you can see that. It's in uh, your padlock and Internet Explorer. You can go to the digital certificate, but if you want to see whether they're working with IS or other, another kind of algorithm, you have to go to the <coughs> secure page and click on the right-hand button and properties. And Chrome, about a year ago, they've changed. And now you have to go to developer, security, high level. You have to do a whole series of um, routes to get to the padlock and find out what sort of encryption is being, is being used, RSA, IAS, or whatever. OK, the strength of this system is simply the secret that the user has is the P by Q. If we don't know the P by Q, we can't find the reverse, because the private key, the private key D, which is the bank's key or the secure website, is uh, the reverse. And then you've got Fidene. I don't know Fidene. I know N. It's a lot smaller. So you can't know what it is. It's a madness to try to break this. You don't know it. If you did know P by Q, you'd be able to no fidene and be able to calculate in just tenths of seconds. Here we've got the typical example of key exchange. Bernardo has a public key, which is E. 
in real values, 65,000 and so, has got an N value, which is a public key. And then it's got a private key that he found and then sends it to Alithia. It's got the same public key and a public key and a, then a private key. It's what I said before. If I want Bernardo to send something to Alithia, they do it with the public key because only Alithia has the private key to open it. But if Bernardo wants to send something signed to Alithia, she, he does a hash so that the uh, signature operation is quicker. They encrypt it with a private key and they send it to Alithia. Alithia has got the Bernardo's public key and their NB module. They can uh, decipher it and check the signature. So the padlock story, if we do what we did before of closing, closing and opening, opening padlocks doesn't work. So you have to do things in order. If I sign and, and I encrypt, it's because I'm sending something secret. If I sign and I encrypt with your public uh, a code, then you have to decipher. If I uh, encrypt with the public one, then you first have to check your signature, and then you have to decipher with your public key. What's the best thing to do? It's best to sign and encrypt, or encrypt and sign. It makes more sense to encrypt and then sign. Because the first thing that you're going to do is to check my signature. If your signatures, my signature is valid, but if I do s sign first and then you encipher, you get the decipher and then you check uh, the signature. It may well be that you find that I'm not real. So that means things, doing things in order, encrypting and signing. As I said. You've got to be able to calculate the reverse, how you do the operation of a big number. And in the case of OpenSSL, when you see the kind of RSA and look at the P by Q and the public key, you'll get other values as well. Coefficient 1, coefficient 2, and you think, what does that mean? It's used to use the Chinese challenge. When I want to send you a session key, 128 bits, it's very simple. It's this number in your module. Your public uh, module is a 256 bits. It's very quick. But when you've got to decipher, you've got a very big number, and your private key is very big. So it takes a long time. And what we do is use the theory of the Chinese remains in which the owner of the key doesn't decipher in mo module N, but in module P and Q. And as I've got P and Q, I can work with that. It does more operations, but they're much quicker because they don't just do it in thousands of bits, but not just one. So they save 70% of the computing time. Do you know how this works? You can go to Crypto Red. There's an online course, the RSA course, which was organized four years ago. And you can see how you can in this uh, key generation with open Zebe, and you can see how you de disencryption, a uh, deciphering. Sorry. Having said that. We've seen how, uh, now we're going to move on to Gen RSA. This is another kind of software. So if you want to go a little bit further, there's another interesting program called Ring and Legend RSA. I've got about half an hour left. So let's now go to the practice software. And then a um, couple of minutes, I'll ask if you've got any queries. How do I download this? You go here. We go to Google and you type Gen RSA. If you type here Gen RSA, Gen RSA is a fam famous command. If we put Gen RSA, you'll see 
quite obviously that it's a command. It's one of the most known. But first of all, you get this software. This is a new version that's just been brought out. You've got the most recent compilation is October this year. And you can do any kind of operations with Gen RSA. So if we download this, we've got it here. So download. And there you can see dot hard. There it is. It's um, starting. It's booting. And I've got others that I've already booted. I'm going to remove this one. I'm going to open the other dot hards. We'll boot it again, but when we boot it, you, it shows you that it's loading, software's loading. And once again, we've got the program on our screen. It's a very simple program. We just put the P times Q prime numbers. Then we'll look at the public key in a public uh, world, whichever one you want, or 65,437. You can use decimal units or not, or as you want. Once I have this, I can generate the key manually or automatically, as open SSL does. You generate 2,048 bits in a, a command mode, open SSL, space, generate 2048, space, my key. You have a file called my key, and it gives you the key. It doesn't ask you anything. It's 2048 bits, and the, the public key is the next number. That's it. <laughs> in this type of programs here, I ask an automatic key. By default, 32 bits, the decimal keys. But there's an interesting feature here, FIDN, that the user only knows. I can force that the public key is always the 65537, not the smallest number. It has to be the odd number because it has to be 1. What happens with P minus 1 and Q minus 1? It's a prime number, so it's 1 is a. It's even, and the other one is odd. I can force that the public key is this value and and they are the same size. OpenSSL does it by default. So automatic generation of the key. Here I have uh, the six bits, six bits, 82 bits. That's the key. And now it, it's a bigger key here, 100 bits. And then we'll do series keys. 100 bit key. So the value is very small, 17 bits. The module is 100. What happens with the private key? It's very close to the end module key. So if I force my public key to have only 17 bits and turn it into 20548, it's the private key is 2047 or 2048. It's very difficult to guess. I'm going to generate another key to have different keys. Number of undecipherable keys. Why open SSL doesn't take this into account? What are these numbers that you don't know, these keys, that do the same that your private key, these peer keys? This is a bank key. I would send in a secret way a session key with this number, reducing it to this module. And the bank with this value of this private key can only recover this. But you can recover it with this value and with these other values. What happens is that those pair, uh, private keys are not known by the user. It's dangerous. I don't want other keys that I don't know and do, that do the same. We're working, working with big figures, big numbers. It's 2,048 bits. That's big numbers, and it's generated automatically here. 
Here I have 2048 bits in the module, 17 mo uh, bits, it's the public key, and the VDN is exactly the same, 2048. Well, the private key is 2047, but not much less. Instead of having one, let's see if I have others appearing. I have some examples because this computer is very slow. It's very slow, indeed. I have a 3,038 numbers. Even though this key could be a key for any bank, in fact, of having those many uh, that, that many private keys, that in fact it's not it's not very nice. It's not the optimum key. It's, we have at least one of these pair private keys. At least we will have one. If you undertake care of the prime numbers P and Q, like open SSL, instead of one, I can have. 4, 40, 50, or 13,057. I don't like this. What happens is that those keys, the, the smallest one, the smallest one has, the smallest one has 2,035 bits. I can break a number of 3,035 bits with brute force? No, I can't. I'm not worried about that. How can I, we minimize this to have just one? Because I, I love the optimal key. I click here and I say, secure prime numbers. Uh, it's my prime multiplied by two plus one. That is still prime. For instance, 23. It's a secure prime. This, the total is 23. 23 is a prime. It's a secure prime. There are strong primes too. There's a difference between the both. But if I work with secure primes, this number is always one. But if this is your key with 3,037 pair, paired private keys, well, your key is as good as mine. Yours is horrible because with this program. It's not very handsome, but open SSL, it's something that uh, it's generating various keys with uh, SSL. SSL and 10 or 12 keys will have this pair private keys, but others will have more than 40. It doesn't use secure prime numbers. Otherwise, there will be 100% with one key. But it doesn't worry with that. I can't speak about paired private keys. If, if, if I explain this to a no IT person, maybe they will believe that this is a vulnerable key. This type of keys is not a vulnerability. There, there are many, there are many here. One of three thousand. All of them are in, in a, in a kind of a cloud near the module, so it's no problem. The non-cipherable numbers are in plain because I'm going to cipher numbers that are in the module. These cipherable numbers are a, a, a value up to x and module n. I'm, I'm ciphering the um, numbers to n until minus 1. If I send the 0, I generate a random value for the key, 128 bits, and 0, 0, everything is 0. It's a number. It's valid. All zeros, 1. These are plain numbers. 1 up to module when n is 1. If if I did n minus 1, 76 up to, I don't know how many, module 77, it will be in plane. 3 in plane, another one, it's very simple, n and minus 1, and then 6 others, at least, in plain text. And don't, don't take care of the uh, p and q. Instead of 40, 60, I have keys of 30,000, 40,000. It's, it's crazy. If I have 40,000 numbers in plain, I'm not going to give you the session key. I sent you uh, 128 key with AES. I reduce it to the module 2048. And there you can find 
the key. The possibility that this happens is completely improbable. A number within 2048 bits. Okay. One of the keys that is here, it's very difficult to find them. One of those numbers are in plane, and it has to be a number with only 128 bits. That's improbable, very unlikely. But if I'm generating a key, it's 5,000 non cipherable numbers. Some of them are in the 128 bits, but it's quite, it's quite impossible. The, the random number that my machine has generated, it could be just one uh, up to 128 uh, probabilities. It's just a number out of the non cipherable in numbers of the bank. It's totally impossible to find it. This is very academic. This is not taken into account. So when we, uh, we will generate keys with OpenSys cell, it gives me the prime Q, prime P, the module, pub public and private keys, and coefficient one and two. And and the exponential. It doesn't use uh, secure prime numbers. I have a number of 80 bits. And then it says that I have to work with, primes, uh, with secure prime numbers. I always have one and nine. One and nine. That's all. In OpenSSL, we would have optimum keys, but it's not bad to have a key here with a lot of hundreds or thousands of paired uh, pri private keys and non cipherable numbers. So I take uh, the secure primes out. I have paired uh, secure and private keys. It's easy. Once I know one, I know the rest. The non cipherable numbers, that's difficult because you need to launch an attack with force, uh, br brute force. I need to know if these P and Q numbers are not cipherable or, or they are. Maybe an X value, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to P minus 1. Another X value, 0, 1, uh, until Q minus 1. Are they cipherable or not? Are they encrypted? Or I have to do various rounds of exponentials. So, so thousands of trials for P and for Q, it's totally impossible. Nobody can do that. So these non cipherable numbers are in a real key are not going to be deciphered. It's a simple uh, key with 80 bits, which takes us uh, half a minute, 80 seconds to find these numbers. This 387, because they are very low values, but we work with real uh, keys with uh, 128 bits. We can't. And discover those names. We don't just know O1 and R minus 1. This has no vulnerability, okay? Let's go to attacks. We have 20 minutes left. Do you have any questions for going ahead about this? No? Gen RSA? No attacks. I was here, yes. This is the attacks slide. What type of attacks uh, for R Gen RCA? Three types, uh, apart from the attack I mentioned before, the acoustic one, based on lateral channel. If you you can look for that for that in at, in Google, it's a PDF document of 15 pages with photos. They were getting the signals with a telephone. It was very easy. You don't need to be a super spy in the NSA. We could break that with a, just a single phone. Factorizing the N uh, number in PDQ. You can factorize uh, numbers in 70, 80 bits, if I want to be more serious. I would work with NS server that you, I didn't put here with MS2 in command mode. 320 bit key in a machine, you can break it in PDQ in an hour. Depends on the machine. 320 bits, 330 bits, it's four days. 
340 days, eight weeks. It's a software that you can uh, download, NSCF. You can factorize numbers. I have some exercises. If you want to see it, uh, you can send me a mail. You see the exponential curve. You can factorize numbers of 320 bits. My PC took uh, an hour and a quarter to do that. To factorize numbers, I'm going to use this software. If I factorize, factorize n in p and q, I have p, q, p minus 1, q minus 1, and I found the inverse number in nanoseconds. But it's very difficult. More than 800 bits have has never been factorized. The problem of factorization is that you cannot edit it. You can to factorize. There's a lot of programs to factorize, seven or eight, ten programs different for factorizing. Well, this do it one. We do it one after the other. You can't stop. There's other attacks that are quite nice, but you can't attack. The one is cyclic encryption attack. You, it breaks what I've done. I have a confidential message. This secret number, I send it to you with your public key, and you can only cipher that with a private key. If it, anybody has he, your public key, they can encrypt it, but it takes a lot of time. With your private key, it's very easy. But if they have your public key and you're the victim, they know your public key, your E and your N module. So if anybody sends you a secret value, it's cyclic uh, encryption. So it, 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 it captures the in cryptogram, and this value is put uh, up to your uh, private uh, key. It, and it obtains another value. This value is activated to your public key in a cyclic way until it gets the first value. And he knows what's the secret. This allows you to do very nice attacks for 60, 80 bits in, in the lab. It takes uh, several minutes. For big keys, 1,000 bits, it's totally impossible. And the other attack, uh, it's the um, birthday paradox attack. You know what is that? You know what that is? You've seen it? The birthday paradox attack? Just one, two? Three, four, okay. It's very easy. It's not a paradox. Here, this is the board, and from 1 January to the 31st of December. We can out, get, get out of the room and you come back. My birthday is on the 4th of January. My birthday is the 8th of December. And, it, and there's one saying, I'm the 8th of December. Oh, it's already there. It's, there's a collision. We get out and we repeat that 10 times. The probability that one birthday is already taken on the screen when 23 people in, inside is more than 50%. That's, a, that's tr the trust level. So it's a paradox. 365 years, uh, days a year. How is it possible that with 23 people, 50 50 percent probability is that my birthday is taken. My 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 birthday is 22nd of January, and maybe nobody here is, uh, has got the same birthday. But you, I take you a person at random with 23 people. Maybe there will, would be already a collision in the day of your birthday. You 8 January, 4 December, 4 December, not just one. This type of attack. It do, it's not done in two exponential n number of bits, but n halves. This is the hash, fun, hash function of uh, 128 bits. The it to exponent exponential to 64. It's very low. So the uh, birthday paradox attack allows you to do an attack where the number of trials is very low because the exponential is divided by 2. So 30, 60, so it's 365 days a year. You have a possibility to search that in Google, the birthday paradox. In It's more interesting in Gen RSA. There's a software called Legendary 
RSA, this software, allowed you to do attacks of a thousand million keys per second. You can do it in your lab, but the RSA values are 2048 bits. If it was 128 bits or 256 bits with the inner hash, we could break it in a couple of minutes, but the RSA keys are very high in bits, so this type of attacks is very difficult. If you want to make an operation, you can do it with this program. You can launch an attack, divide, and you will win. I have a machine with eight processors. I have a rate of one million attacks per second. I have 100 machines. Uh, it's 100,000 million keys per second. That's interesting. We work with the very big uh, keys in RSA. I, I mean, imagine it's in, in a botnet that is very good, so we could, it's huge numbers and we can't uh, attack it, but we can, we can try in the lab. Gen RSA, it's very simple, it's very funny. With Gen RSA, if I want to sign digitally, we have this real, real key, clean data. I can say that hexadecimal, we will create a key to 2048 bits. The key here is a hexadecimal. Instead of being 65,000, etc., it's 10001. The digital certificate shown by Internet Explorer shows 010001, 24 bits in three bytes. So, here I generate it in an automatic way, and here we have the key, a paired uh, private uh, key, the public uh, key is very small, the mode and the private key 2046, we can't break it. If I wanted to cipher a number, it's easy, operations, cipher, decipher, any number. This one, in hexadecimal. Just a minute. Any number, I want to cipher it. The hexadecimal is this value. I can say I want to use text. With text, hello, how are you? How are you? We can do it. It's just for the lab. I could, I would need to code it, to encode it. What is the size of my module? My module has 28 bits. I have blocks of three by four, three by eight, 24. That's a way. I have different numbers within the 28 bit block, 2048, so it's a bit text. We don't use it in practice because we don't use it to cipher documents. But we can use text once I have this value. This is the value I'm going to decipher. And there's no science behind this. So, if anybody has a doubt, we could do a ciphering, deciphering operation with an, libraries that are in, in the internet. Mumbai Fish. Mobile Fish, do you know it? It's a very good site, 25 million different things. The open SSL, I downloaded it from here. The Mobile Fish it is a website. Here you have a website with 25 million things that you can do. Very interesting indeed. You can work with very big numbers. There are mathematical uh, items that are really interesting. You can test these numbers with this software. Mobile fish is an example. Attacks, that's the most important part, and I have mm, little time for that. With small numbers, let's do attacks. It's going to be fast. We're not going to use a 2048-bit key. It's going to be fast. And I'm going to put the numbers. Instead of hexa hexadecimal, I'll use the decimals. Very small key. 48 bits. That's easy. Public key, key, small key, and I generate it automatically 
This is a public key generated here. Here. So the public key is not the standard one. It chooses the smallest number. Three or five or seven or nine wasn't were not accepted. It's the 11, number 11, it's the smallest possible. Factorizing. Attacks are factorizing in two seconds. But if you want to work to with factorizing elements, you M sieve 153, that's the program. 300 bits, you can break it in several minutes. Here, factorizing, you can do your lab practices. Let's do the cyclical attack. In the cyclical type of attacks, here you have the ciphered message and the original message. Let's see what would be the ciphered message, the encrypted message. I want to send this guy this message, one, two, three, four. The, this window says, okay, the value I want to send is one, two, three, four, five. Ciphering data. This is a cryptogram, okay? This is a cryptogram. Control C. I forget about the figure. The message was one, two, three, four, five. Attack this guy in a cyclic way. The cryptogram was the same one, two, three, four, five. I only know about the victim is the public exponential and the module. I ask a, a series of ciphering until it gets to the key. Look, start. It takes this number here, put it up to the volume, to the exponential, reduce to the module, and that's the number. Again, it's doing the same cyclically. It's a cycle, and one, two, three, four, five will appear. It's going to be very fast. It's a cycle. In round 80,900, I found one, two, three, four, five. Until that moment, I didn't know it was a secret number. When I ciphered one, two, three, four, five, I got one, eight, two. We have this big number. So the previous uh, round was the plain text. So we found the secret without knowing the private key of the victim. It run, runs with small numbers, 100 bits, that's a maximum for the lab. But in practice, we work with big numbers, 2,048 bits. So it will, it will take <laughs> centuries to, to break it. But it's practical. We can decipher it with a public key and not with a private key. If you love mathematics, well, in fact, it's because there are rings forming. Module N is 77, 7 by 11. Where are the numbers of N module? And, well, 76, it's a whole ring. But when you do the cyclical attack, this full ring is divided in small uh, rings, length 4 or length 8, with different eight different numbers. If I see all the rings with the numbers, we would have all the values of the full module. So according to what I get in the small ring or the big ring, I will it will take more time or less time. It's a concept of rings. It's, a no, it's not a vulnerability. It's impossible to break this with real numbers. And then the uh, birthday paradox attack. What does this program do? I just need the, the exponential and the module from the victim. I don't need to capture any other data. In the cyclical attack, I had to capture the cryptogram, the message that was encrypted, and find the secret. In this case, I don't need that. I will start with any message, any number, two, three, four, five, whatever. It's advisable to work with one, two, because it's faster. So the program takes the module, this number. It's going to divide it in two, two parts. Half uh, is left and half is right. The counters from zero to n means, and the j counters n means minus 1, 2, n minus 1. So I divided the n module in two halves, right and left. On the left, I have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I take number 2, and we're going to be up to 0, and the result is 1, and, so, and I do it in a succession. I go to the j part. We have this other half, 340 million numbers, and I take two, 
up to this number, plus one, plus two, etc. It makes all the operation. We'll have different results on left and right. When there's a collision between the two halves, the system has, bro has been broken. We, you know the private key or the paired private key. Sometimes the number I can find breaks the value I, I started with at the beginning, but it doesn't break the generic key. So let's run it. It's going to be very fast. This is all the operations done by the software. But this machine is quite slow. Two million uh, encryptions per second. If it takes too long, we can stop it. That's it. It's done. You see? It found it's, it's, it's a collision on J and E, the two halves, after 27 million encryptions. Very, very fast. So the private key is 34183. Let's see if it's true. It's here. No, it's not this one. I don't see the key. It says that the pri private key is that one. Yes, yes. Three, four, one, two, three. I could have given the private key for this one as well. As you can see, it's very interesting, this kind of attack. And what's interesting here, it allows... Well, what happens is that each computer sends the first number to target. And it sends the first J number. So all the computers that are in J are in N plus 1 that have target. And the, those that are in computer DI have the J computers as a target. So when there's a collision, it tells the server, and the server says they automatically found the key. This here, that I have time to decipher, is uh, two years. So I'm a bit worried about this. I can launch this program with this software and go to the beach and wait for my uh, mobile to ring. But that would be easy if it was a key of three, four, or 500 bits, but when it's 2,000 bits, it's impossible. You simply can't do it because there isn't compu sufficient computing time. But it can, you can do it, and it's another kind of vulnerability if these programs worked with a smaller numbers. I don't know if you've got any questions because I've run over time. If you've got any doubts or queries, queries please send me an email and I'd be more than happy to solve them. What I've uh, explained here is, you can see, isn't so uh, complicated as you think. It is very conceptual, but it's not very mathematical. Why keys are a certain size, it's very, very difficult for students to understand. But the mathematical side of things isn't complicated unless you want to get a little bit more in depth. Either there you're a mathematician or you're lost. But it's very simple. You can see the strengths and the weaknesses. It's easy to understand how far our security can go. Any further questions? No? OK, let's finish, because we're more or less on time. Let's leave it there. Any other things you want to ask, please send me an email.